and I have started recording. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Happy Sunday evening to you all. Um, I see we've got a lot of folks from all over the place. Um, we've got Karen from Oregon, uh, Stephanie from Georgia, James from Palm Harbor, Florida, Pat from Chicago, Sue from Minnesota, wish I could say everybody's name and where they're from. I'm Adrian, and I'm uh, based in Austin, Texas. I'm a teaching artist here and um, also practicing artist. So I'm joining you from my, my studio space in Austin. And I have been uh, teaching all ages for the past 12 years. I've been teaching adults for the past eight or nine years. And um, oh, I've got a lovely comment there from, oh, that's, that's a direct message to me. Oh, nice to see that some people are coming back who've been enjoying the classes before. Um, I'm really been enjoying it as well. So this is an ongoing series uh, that I've partnered with Michaels to bring you. So if you have been wanting a to you know join a beginner level drawing class, you're in the right place. And um, if you're more intermediate or advanced artists, we'll definitely have some some classes coming up that are more geared towards intermediate and advanced artists. Uh, tonight's class is on composition um, and thumbnail drawings for still life. So um, in previous classes so far, we covered several beginner level skills from uh, introduction to graphite, tonal shading, some alternative shading techniques, and then uh, the most recent class this past week was on um, implied line, and that was a lot of fun. So uh, if you are just joining us and you haven't attended any of the previous classes, definitely uh, check the chat because it looks like Kelly has dropped um, some of the, the previous classes there, the links to them on YouTube. And uh, Kelly will be, like she said, uh, monitoring them the chat so she'll interrupt me with any questions so definitely let me know if you've got any questions or comments throughout the class um, and we'll go ahead and get started here and switch to my tabletop view so uh, anything that you make tonight please tag your work with the hashtags make it with Michaels or Michaels classes if you post online with any of your work from any of the classes from previous classes, uh, Artist Loft 101 classes on YouTube, uh, do the same thing or from work from this evening's class and follow me on Instagram. My handle is Adrian Hodge Art. And there's all my other information from one of my business cards. And I've got a couple of upcoming online independent classes. One is called Mindfulness with Ink. And the other one is called Drawing and Painting Clouds. And those are both three hour workshops that I'm hosting on Zoom. And Kelly uh, will drop my link tree in the chat and you can click on that. Or um, if you're watching the recording of this later, you can just uh, Google Adrian Hodge link tree and you'll see all the links for signing up for independent classes or up even more upcoming Michaels classes but you can use the promo code on my uh, online shop to sign up for both of these workshops and get $20 off using the promo code Wednesday because I made the promo code on Wednesday. So, okay, so there's my little plug for independent stuff and there's some, some of my work that I do with calligraphy ink and lots of cloud-based art. So feel free to check all that out. Okay, so let's talk about the supplies that I had on the supply list for the class tonight. So I wanted everyone to grab some still life items and then uh, some sketch paper. I've got the artist loft uh, drawing pad or sketching pad. Either one will work great. And then the 12, the set of 12 artist loft sketching pencils. So we've got a variety of H and B pencils there. And if you 
want to know all about the H and B pencils, that intro to graphite and drawing forms class really breaks down all of the numbers and letters on the sides of the pencils. And we'll be repeating that class actually coming up um, in early September. So if you missed that and you want to attend that live again, that'll be coming up again soon. And then uh, blending stumps or tortillions, we'll be using some of those tonight. If you want a, a synthetic eraser or any eraser. And then I asked you to get the uh, Artist Loft uh, charcoal pencil set because for what we're going to be doing tonight, it would be nice to have some, some charcoal mixed in with our graphite as well. So, um, but before we get started, um, who knows what a thumbnail sketch is? What is a thumbnail sketch? Or take a guess if you uh, don't know what it is, what do you think it is just by the word thumbnail sketch? Okay, yeah, small, something small, a small sketch, exactly. So uh, if you're new to thumbnail sketching, they are an incredible tool to have in your artist toolbox that you you come back to and use all the time because uh, for a variety of reasons, but they are very, yeah, small, quick composition sketches. Um, somebody said two by two box. Yeah, so they're small because they're, you know, like a thumbnail, they're, they're pretty small. Um, also, you know, there's that whole thing where you see like in the movies, like an artist holding up their thumb and sort of eyeballing what they're looking at and, and thinking about you know, the composition as a whole. So that's the other reason that we refer to them as, as a thumbnail sketch is that idea of finding the composition and using your, your thumb to do that can be helpful because it sort of orients you to um, creating like a viewfinder. Um, and in the, the Artist Loft 101 uh, set, it does come with a little black viewfinder. And I just realized as I was saying the word viewfinder that I left mine at home. But if you have a little uh, uh, viewfinder that comes with that artist loft set, then that can, can be helpful as well with our still life tonight. But I actually don't have mine to show you at the moment. But we're going to be drawing a variety of boxes, not necessarily just square boxes. And that viewfinder is a square. But uh, they, they can be, they don't necessarily have to be, you know, a two by two box like that viewfinder gives you. It can be, you know, a rectangle, it can be more of a, a widescreen sketch or a, you know, a long skinny portrait sketch. So really what we're focusing on tonight is using thumbnails to create a composition. So um, before we get started, I want to talk about the creating the still life itself and just some tips for getting your still life set up. So do we have any questions up until this point, though, before I start talking about the still life? I'm not seeing. No questions at the moment, Adrian. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so the first thing that I want you to do is just take your still life items and pull out anything that you feel like is overwhelming you or is too complicated. We want to keep this really simple tonight, it's just mainly because we are limited on time. So I've got a, a very small still life here, but I also wanted it to be visible to everybody as well. So I've got a, a rose and a piece of lace and this, uh, I forget what these are called, but you know, one of these little things that falls off of the, the trees around here in Austin, Texas, and then a, a piece of twine. And I have some other things like a shell and this cool stick, but I decided to pull those out because it just felt like a little too much. So we're gonna keep it really simple. I also have a piece of brown paper here. So if you've got like a pretty basic uh, backdrop behind, like on your table or wherever you're, you're putting your still life items, it might be a good idea to get like, uh, 
tablecloth or a sheet or something that's plain that you could put behind your still life just to limit distractions. If it's on your tabletop, then a piece of paper would be fine, just a white sheet of paper. I mainly just grabbed the brown paper because I wanted my still life to, you know, pop a little bit more. And also I wanted to be able to see the lace. So um, I wasn't very visible against the, the white paper. But uh, that, just a, a plain sheet of paper would be fine. But if you have something handy that you could kind of block out any distractions or things in the their background, one way that you could quickly create a backdrop is to grab a stack of books and uh, drape a sheet over the uh, stack of books and then place your still life items in front of that. And that would create a nice backdrop for you very quickly. Um, or if you had, you know, a large sheet of paper that you could just prop up behind it. You're also going to want a really strong light source. And I realized not all of this was listed on the supply list. It just feels like an overwhelming amount of things to put on a supply list. And they're all easy to grab things here at the beginning. Um, I've got a nice, really warm lamp here that I've moved away from me because it felt like it was overheating my phone, but I want you guys to have as dramatic of a light falling across your still life items as possible. Like I'm going to move my lamp closer for just a second, just to show what that does when I have that strong light source. So it just creates a really dramatic shadow here um, on the side of my objects. And I love that and I want it to be there, but for the sake of not losing, um, <laughs> losing my, you know, screen image to my, my phone overheating, I moved the lamp away, but you're not going to worry about that. So have a strong light source because that's going to give you some really bold, um, dramatic shadows falling across your, your backdrop. So the, the better. Uh, the stronger your light source, the better. Okay, so just to review, you want to create some kind of backdrop. You want a strong light source. Um, natural light is best. If you, you know, were near a window, that would be preferable, but um, a nice, strong, you know, warm light is good. If you've got, like in my studio here, I've got fluorescent overhead lights, and those are not always the best for creating dramatic lighting. Okay, so any questions about setting up your still life or any, you know, substitutes, anything like that? All right, so we could spend probably an entire class just talking about the best way to set up an interesting still life and make your still life as interesting as possible and how to, you know, make the still life kind of do most of the work for you so that all you have to do is sit there in the chair and look at it and it's going to be a great composition because you've basically composed the still life to have an, an optimal composition. But we're going to focus on using thumbnails to create that composition. So I've, like I said, I've been teaching adults for many years and when I set up a still life in the classroom, what tends to happen is people are can't find a satisfying view of it because they sit somewhere wherever they're just you know sitting in the room they're like well I don't like this view of it let me move to the other side of the room and really they're just feeling overwhelmed by some of the subject matter or they kind of don't know where to begin and so I always encourage them to just you know park themselves wherever they are. And then, you know, we start talking about thumbnail sketches because how helpful they are to finding this optimal composition. Okay, so, but one thing you definitely want to make sure to have, I just realized this as I'm about to move on, is have a sense of, and this was difficult to achieve with my, my little bitty still life here, is, a sense of foreground, middle ground, and background. So you want something that feels like it's in front. And I was waiting for this moment to do this. So if I, this kind of feels like it's all one thing, but here's a little trick real quick to create a sense of foreground. I'm just gonna pop off one or two of the petals on my rows and I'm gonna put them like kind of zhuzh them and 
drop them around in front, maybe put one a little bit in the middle there even. Oh no, yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, so what that does is that that creates a sense of something in the foreground, right? Like the petals are now closer to me than the, the rose itself. So if all of this feels like it's falling more in like a middle ground together, and I realize this is an overhead view of a still life and you guys are probably looking at yours in front of you, uh, but maybe you're doing overhead, but either way, taking an element from the still life and pulling it out and putting it in front of yourself or in front of the rest of the still life can quickly create a sense of foreground, middle ground and background. So, you know, play around with your still life a little bit until you get it in a, make it, you know, have that sense of foreground, middle ground and background. And you want your still life to tell a story. So you can do that with the still life or you can do that with these thumbnail drawings. Okay, so I'm ready to start sketching some thumbnails now. So I'm gonna take just a, um, one of my darker pencils, just so that you can see my, my boxes as I start to sketch them. But you should probably draw your boxes with like a, uh, an H, a 2H, a, a 4H, one of your lighter pencils. So the higher the number on your H pencils, the lighter your pencil will be. And the darker pencils are gonna be the, the higher numbers on the, the B pencils. And that intro to graphite class explains all of that in depth, uh, which Kelly dropped in the chat uh, a moment ago, or you can find on YouTube under Artist Loft 101. So I'm using a 5B, like I said, just so that you can see my boxes coming across on the screen. And I'm just going to start sketching boxes. They don't have to be perfect squares or rectangles. Um, if you want to get a ruler and measure them and make them perfect, you're welcome to. But I like to just dive in and just draw a variety of boxes. So with any thumbnail sketching that you do to get started on on any work of art or to find a composition that you like, I recommend doing at least five or six thumbnails. So I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to squeeze all five or six onto this one piece of paper. I'm just going to draw maybe three of them here and then switch to a different, or here I could do fun little vignette like this, four of them. So I've got three squares and one rectangle, but have a variety. So like when I switch to the next page, I might do a long kind of panoramic rectangle or maybe do more of a landscape rectangle. But before you get started sketching anything, just give yourself a variety of boxes. So aim for five to six and try to have, you know, a variety of frames. You could even do a circle or an oval if you wanted to. I mean, the sky's the limit on different ways that you could frame your, your still life. And the reason for this is that we want to just get all of our ideas out on paper before we get started on the drawing. There, well, there's lots of reasons for doing a thumbnail. So Number one is to find a composition that you're satisfied with. So you're finding a composition that speaks to you the most. Most of the time when we just get started drawing, we maybe focus on, on the whole. We're maybe, you know, just looking at the whole thing and just drawing it sort of, you know, intuitively, like what feels the most obvious, right? But then the more we investigate, we maybe are struggling with a part of the drawing. And so doing a thumbnail right off the bat would give you an opportunity to investigate different parts of your subject. So do that now in the thumbnail stage, you can zoom in on, you know, a particular part of your still life, or you can zoom out, or you can focus on like one little detail of it or some aspect that's really interesting. And by the end of doing, you know, five, at least five or six thumbnails, you're going to definitely know which one is your favorite, which one is drawing your interest the most. 
and it maybe is not going to be the first one that you drew. It might be, it might be the very first thumbnail that you sketched, but more likely it's going to be, you know, the fourth or the fifth one or one of your later ideas. So a thumbnail sketch is very loose um, and, and basic. It doesn't, or it can be more detailed. And that was why I wanted you to grab the, the charcoal pencils because they're going to enable us to fill in some dark areas much quicker than our, our graphite pencils. If you wanna just stick to your graphite the whole time, you're welcome to as well. Um, so I'm just gonna get started um, because the, the whole purpose of what we're doing tonight is the, the process is leading us to the, to the end result here. So they do not have to be detailed. They do not have to be perfect. The perspective does not have to be exact. I mean, they are, these are beginning sketches, preliminary sketches. This is something that you can do when you are first beginning to find your compositions. So I'm just going to tell a story of why these are so essential to an art practice when it comes to um, creating more involved or more developed works. Um, in one of my painting classes, that uh, I was teaching here at a, a community center in Austin. Um, I had a woman who, well, I've had plenty of classes where somebody missed the first day, but this was just such a great example of why um, thumbnails are so important. So on the first day of class, I you know, always talk about thumbnail sketches and composition. And then um, in the second class, we kind of get rolling more with the, you know, working on a painting. So I had a, a lady show up late to the, the second class and, um, you know, she'd missed the first class and then she was a bit frazzled because she showed up late to the second class even. And she came in and she immediately got started on this landscape that she wanted to paint. And her landscape photograph was um, square but her canvas was rectangular, as most canvases are. And without thinking, she put the canvas on the easel in portrait, and she put her horizon line right in the middle of the canvas, and she started painting. And I walked over and, you know, said hello and tried to get her, you know, to take a few deep breaths and get more settled into the class and everything, you know, before I immediately said, you know, you might want to turn your your canvas landscape so it's, you know, similar to your photograph or maybe we can tape off the margins so that your, your canvas is reflecting the square shape of your photograph. And she was, you know, just really frazzled, but I just couldn't help but think how doing some thumbnail sketches definitely would have helped her, you know, troubleshoot all that. So that's the other main reason for doing thumbnail sketches is it troubleshoots those issues that are going to arise, you know, regardless in our art practice, those are going to come up. And by doing this, you can troubleshoot them in a little box sketch rather than on your, your final paper or, you know, with your more permanent feeling um, materials, even though I, try not to think of any art material as permanent. And that's really why I love working with ink so much and that mindfulness in ink class. I didn't intend to make a little commercial um, for this when I started saying this. It just happens to be a fact that that's one of the things I love about working with ink is that, yes, it is extremely permanent. It's the most permanent material that you can think of, but that is such a great analogy for you know, a mindful based art practice because, um, you know, you sort of embrace and accept what happens on the, um, on the page as you're working and you learn from the mistakes that are happening and you let the materials guide you rather than trying to force them to do what you think that they need to do. And so, you know, in that regard, I tell myself when I'm working on a big project with ink, like they're just, there's no such thing as something that's permanent and can't start over. Even if I'm working on like a really expensive, you know, custom built panel for a commission, I like to tell myself, I can always get another custom built panel made if everything falls apart. You can always get a new piece of paper. You can always 
start over and it's not the end of the world and we learn by doing and practicing and that's what this is about tonight. Um, I just happened to glance at the chat and see somebody's asking, am I going to change the overview setting? It's hard to see the small view. Uh, no, I'm going to keep it like this um, the whole time. That's why I found a still life that was overhead and that's why I'm encouraging you guys to set up your own still life, especially because we've only got um, 35 minutes left on the class and it would be nice if you could, you know, keep going with this after the class and not just, you know, if we're just drawing my um, sketch, then you're going to lose my still life unless you took a screenshot, I guess. Um, okay, so I'm just, I just dove in and just got started here and I'm doing just a very, you know, I didn't think about it at all and I just started drawing kind of the, the whole thing. So my first sketch is very loosely based. And if you're, you know, watching how loose I am with my lines and thinking that you'd like to learn how to loosen up the last class that we did this past week was on implied line and about how to loosen up when you're beginning a sketch. And it looks like uh, Kelly dropped that in the chat a little bit earlier. So check that one out. Um, that was a really fun exercise. Okay, so I've just kind of drawn the, the whole thing here. So that's a good way to just break the ice with your thumbnails. And then I'm going to give you several more tips for how to optimize your composition here. But I just wanted to get one sketch going. OK, so now that I've just kind of sketched the entire thing, it is kind of hard to see my sketch. So I'm going to create some quick contrast in my thumbnail sketch by just taking my charcoal and um, emphasizing all of the, the darkest areas really quickly. So I'm just going to fill in everything that I feel like is a 10 on a value scale. So if you've been following along for all the classes, we spent three classes talking about value shading techniques, one entire class on tonal shading, and then a class on hatching and cross hatching, and a class on stippling and scribbling. But in all of those classes, I referred to our absolute solid black as a 10 on that value scale and zero as the blank paper or absolute white. So in this thumbnail sketch right now, I'm just filling in everything that I see is a 10 on the value scale. And so that's going to help me visualize, you know, how this would look as a more developed drawing of the still life. And I can quickly see like how much contrast is available to me. I keep going back to this one. This one's definitely my favorite. This one or that one, I, it's all about the details for me. So that one where those petals were in front of my little base was, were definitely my favorite one. Although I did like that one. So like I said, sometimes you do end up going with the one that is, you know, the composition that shows everything in the, the still life. But for me, it's often the, the details. But the way that I can see how that's going to look as a finished product quickly is by quickly filling in those darkest areas. And if you don't have any super dark areas, exaggerate the, the darkest shadows that you're seeing. And this is where if I had a really strong shadow falling across the page, I'm going to go ahead and just put it in there anyway. So if I brought my lamp back over, I would have a really dramatic shadow falling that direction. So I can put that in there. And then I'm just going to quickly darken up some of my lines. Oh. oh, yeah, there's a nice comment from Anne saying um, observation. She's finding with a thumbnail that. Uh, in her still life, she's seeing things she didn't notice at first, like oil in the bottle. Now I see it's really cool reflected light around the base, so I will switch to a feature this item more in my composition. Exactly, yeah. So as you're doing the thumbnail, you might realize, oh, hey, I really like, you know, like your example, or maybe I really like 
the lace on here. So I want to zoom in and really get just like the little stitching that I'm seeing in the lace. And I want to make sure that I'm emphasizing that in my my final sketch. So we're not doing any final sketches tonight. This entire class is just about thumbnail sketching and optimizing our thumbnail sketches. And I'm also working in a lot of stuff about composition as I go here. And this is not the uh, last time that I will talk about composition in this drawing series. So if you stick around, I'll definitely talk about composition in some other ways, um, specifically how to take photographs um, with composition in mind to use as source references for, for other drawings and things that we'll be doing a little bit later in this series. So I'll, I'll definitely come back to composition. And like last week when I talked about implied line, that will come up again. OK, so speaking of that, I want to talk about the rule of thirds for a moment. So in any class about composition, where you're going to talk about the rule of thirds. and I'm sure several of you know about the rule of thirds. Who wants to tell me what the rule of thirds is? Um, somebody was asking when you draw with charcoal, do you need to do something to preserve your picture so it won't smear after it's finished? Um, yes, you can spray it with a um, fixative like um, that, that's specifically for graphite and uh, charcoal. And I'm sure Michaels has a number of fixatives. I'm not sure if Artist Loft, if there's an Artist Loft fixative for charcoal, um, should look into that. But I know Michaels has a number of fixatives that, that you could buy. Oh, I just moved one of my, my petals. Sorry to anybody who was drawing my still life there. Um, Okay, so somebody said things in groups of three are more attractive. That is a great guess. That is true. Groups of three. <laughs> That's not the rule of thirds um, that I'm talking about. Okay, foreground, middle ground, and background. Uh, that definitely applies. Yeah, but Sue has it there. Sue Johnson. Uh, dividing your picture into a grid system. Okay, so I'm going to come back to, to these thumbnails in just a second, but and I, I'll go into this again and in a more sophisticated way in later classes. But for now, I'm just going to draw a quick little thumbnail sketch using uh, the, the rule of thirds. So there's this wonderful thing that the Greeks figured out with uh, you know, the, the golden ratio and the idea of uh, this, you know, this perfect ratio that if we use that to break down a number of things we find that they are very aesthetically pleasing. Pleasing. So, the spiral of of a flower, um, a wave cresting, the human face, and a rectangle. When we divide a rectangle using this golden ratio, we find that things can be framed in a very aesthetically pleasing way. So, what we do is we sketch a rectangle. And then you can eyeball it or you could grab a ruler if you wanted to. I like to just eyeball it and we're just breaking it down into thirds. So we're breaking it down on the vertical and the horizontal. We're dividing it into thirds and we create a grid. Uh, your phone, your iPhone or any Android phone that you might have has uh, this function on your camera. If you go to your settings on your phone, it will say grid and you can uh, toggle that on so that when you take a photograph, your image will be framed using the, the rule of thirds and it'll have this grid just in your view on your camera. And so what you do when you're taking a photograph, I'm veering off into my, my photography lesson here, but um, is you'll put your most interesting things at these points where the lines intersect. So where are lines of thirds intersect, you want to put your most interesting things in the composition. So that's why when we're looking at a landscape, 
oftentimes in a, in a beautiful photograph or, or a beautiful painting, you'll have um, the horizon line dropped down to either the, the line of thirds, the bottom line of thirds, or in the top line of thirds. So that's going to create a sky that's very vast and imposing, or it's going to create a lot of interest on the ground if the horizon line was here. Um, so in a landscape, that's how it would apply. Um, if you're taking a photograph of a face and a face is just framed like this, you're already going to have the mo most interesting parts of the frames at those intersecting lines because the human face can be um, framed in a rectangle and divided into thirds like this. And we'll get into that when it comes to uh, the class on facial proportions a little later in this series. But for now, I just want you to be aware of the rule of thirds. So how does that apply to your thumbnail sketch? Well, that's probably what is so interesting to me about this particular sketch is because if I were to take this and draw my lines of thirds, some of the most interesting parts of this still life item are happening around the points where those lines would be intersecting you know kind of the where the base uh, meets the edge of the flowers there there's a bit of an implied horizon line maybe around that point um, and then right here where it's sort of the the ground meets the the edge of the base so things like that whatever your your eye goes to as the most interesting part of your still life object then in your next thumbnail sketch no matter what the orientation is on the sketch. So even with um, this one, I'm not going to draw the grid lines, but I'm just going to think about dividing it into thirds. And so I'm going to start with this one. I'm going to kind of do the thing I did with, with this one that I like so much is I'm going to have part of my little nesty thing coming into the frame right about here. And then have the piece of lace coming in so that it stops right here. And that just already creates that divide on my horizontal grid lines. All right, so um, so yeah, thinking about the, the rule of thirds for sure. There is lots more that I, I can say on that, but I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent. Um, so yeah, exactly in uh, photography. Oh, and then somebody said use hairspray. I meant to say that too. Yeah, hairspray, if you don't have a, a fixative, hairspray will will keep your, your charcoal from smearing, but hairspray is not archival quality, so you might um, you might not like what happens um, to your materials on the page, you know, since the hairspray is not, can be kind of sticky or, um, but yeah, and spray it outside, whatever, if you do use a fixative and try to stand, you know, uh, spray in the direction of the, the wind so that you don't spray fixative and then inhale it because um, that's never fun. That's the public school art teacher in me coming out every time I say stuff like that. I just like hear my voice like telling my old high school students when they go outside what to do when they spray it. They used, like the first time a student ever sprays fixative they're always so nervous and it's like that they're gonna spray it in their their face. You gotta stand where the wind is in your favor. Or, or where there's no wind, try to get somewhere like on the side of your house where there's not like a wind tunnel happening. Maybe put some rocks down on top of your paper and then spray it. Those are all my fixative tips for you. Okay, so um, another thing you can do in these thumbnail sketches is make edits as you go. If you find that like every time you come up against a certain item, like there might be a part of your still life that you're falling more in love with, or there may be a part of your still life item that you're just starting to despise more and more as you go. So then this could be a way to make you think, I'm gonna just take that out. You know, maybe I'm running into issues with a particular part of the, the still life. And then this tells you 
maybe just take it out. It's your still life. You can just remove an item that you're not enjoying drawing because art making should be fun, I think. Okay, so that's maybe not my favorite one so far, but that's a pretty good one. I'll go ahead and move on to another one. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is um, negative space. So negative space is obviously very important um, for a number of reasons, but it's sometimes the last thing that beginning artists tend to think about. And that would be, you know, the reason why we often go for you know, drawing everything in the kitchen sink that we have in view and not zooming out or looking at the details, but sometimes the most interesting composition can be the one that has the most negative space in it. So with the rule of thirds or maybe through editing out or just zooming in on a specific thing, you're introducing either more or less negative space. I mean, there's gonna be negative space regardless. There's gonna be some space around your, your objects that you're not drawing anything or where the background is more dominant, but people have a tendency to think that they need to, you know, put something interesting in every part of, of the composition, but often the negative space, you know, can be the thing that's creating interest. So really limiting it down to just the details like that. The other thing that, um, to keep in mind with negative space is balance, creating a balance of your subject in the, the composition. Um, like with this one, I don't know in this thumbnail that I have really balanced everything, but definitely in some of these other examples, there feels like a, there's the elements are very balanced here because I've got the shape of the bottom of my base is, you know, you fear, feel the mirror image of that shape in the negative space there. Um, let's see. This one, I think, has a nice use of negative space because in that area where the, the grid lines would be intersecting, so I'm creating a focal point not on part of the, the object here, but on the negative space of the object, because that is an interesting, you know, shape that is created between the handle and the side of the base. So you're drawing attention to the, uh, the negative space. And yeah, there will definitely be uh, a class that will focus more on negative space coming up um, as well. This is a very ongoing series that I'm very thrilled to be teaching. So there's lots of opportunities for me to hone in on certain elements in, in drawing and just focus on those. So as I'm talking about negative space, it's making me want to make a still a thumbnail sketch that is focused on that. So I'm just doing just the corner of this lace here and a little bit of this rose petal, which I just kind of moved a little too far up, but so I've got the corner of the lace and then just two rose petals. So I'm really letting the negative space be the star of this composition. And I'm just drawing with my charcoal pencil now. Um, it really doesn't matter which material you sketch your thumbnails with, as long as you, you know, feel comfortable and confident making permanent lines right off the bat. But if you're, because your charcoal, it's not permanent, but it's a little harder to erase than one of your graphite pencils. But if you want to stick to your H pencils for your early sketching until you're more comfortable, but I mean, honestly, a thumbnail sketch is pretty non-committal. So why not dive in with your, your heavier materials? Okay, um, what eraser works best for charcoal? That would be your, your kneaded eraser, your gum eraser that um, that Artist Loft 101 set comes with one of those. Um, 
I didn't put that on the supply list just because, like I said, with the thumbnails, it's easy to just move on and do another thumbnail sketch. So if you make a huge mistake, I wouldn't worry about it too much if you can't erase it with the charcoal. Um, I think it's easier to just leave that alone and, and do another thumbnail. Okay, so I wanna do one where I'm really zooming in on something now. I haven't done that yet, but I definitely had one of these other examples where I was zooming in on a, a certain part of my still life. So, and that's where I wanted to talk about telling a story. I think when you really zoom in on a particular thing in your, I'm gonna to switch to graphite for this one so that I can erase a little easier. And actually, I'm gonna do a bigger one for zooming in. Let me get another thumbnail going here. So this is where I'm just going to zoom way in on this lace and draw it nice and big. And maybe I'll do this again where I really place it and think about the rule of thirds a little bit more. But for now, I just really want to do a little study of this lace. Because I feel like out of all of the items in my little still life here, it maybe tells the most of a story. So the uh, person who commented about the oil in their, um, their bottle earlier that the reflected light that that was creating, you know, a lot of interest um, for them, that could be the story that you're telling, but whatever that means to you, I just love, you know, lines like that, that create Get our imaginations going so you know what story are you telling is it the something you know autobiographical or this aesthetic or is it the item has like a lot of meaning or is it a item that like a lot of people would draw meaning from and how are you emphasizing that and it could be by just simply zooming in on on the details of that item or the part of that item that is the most meaningful to you. Um, I actually have a class coming up with the Doherty Art Center that I, I uh, teach with here in Austin and it's online on Zoom, then the class is definitely happening, but I think there are still spaces if anybody wanted to register, it's just a $7 class. It's happening this coming Thursday and it's called nostalgia for now and it's a watercolor still life class that uh, focuses on basically what I just said using a specific item to tell a story and so just something that came to mind because that class is about using you know an item that has a lot of special meaning for us now something that you know is maybe a totem item in their life and so something that just came to mind was a little wind up teddy bear that I had as a child that my eight year old daughter really became attached to in the last couple of years. And so if I were to put that in a still life, um, I would maybe focus on the little the wind up part of the teddy bear would be the detail that I would zoom in on. Uh, so it's called Nostalgia for Now. And if you click on my link tree um, link that I dropped in, or that Kelly dropped for us in the chat a little earlier, um, you can find the, the link to register for my classes through the Doherty Art Center. And that class is coming up this Thursday. Um, and yeah, I am a pretty well-known artist. I like to say I'm famous in certain circles. My daughter thinks I'm famous. Um, <laughs> uh, there are not going to be any more shading classes this week, but all of those classes are on YouTube. Oh, actually, no, I lied. There is, uh, I think coming up this Wednesday, there is a class on value and drawing drapery, and then there's a class for more intermediate um, drawings. Um, 
or for more intermediate artists and advanced artists on uh, drawing a tree. So um, that one is, is definitely not for, or it's not not for beginners. If you wanted to attend it as a beginner and just watch, but I'm definitely gonna be jumping from a more intermediate to advanced uh, stance in, in that class. Um, the one on trees, but the one on drapery is geared towards beginners. And those are, are coming up. You should be able to find those on the, the Michaels website now. Okay, so in this thumbnail sketch, I'm definitely getting into the details here, but I was just honing in on the, the pattern that's happening. And I was definitely looking at the negative space in between the pattern rather than drawing the, the lace itself, just because it's easier to draw the shapes that are happening that I'm seeing on the brown paper and as opposed to the, the lace. And so I'm making the lace visible through uh, that negative space there. But I definitely think that pattern, that lace pattern, is telling a story. Oh, I see a lovely comment there from from Michaels. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, oh, and there Kelly just dropped the upcoming class links. Okay, so we're running out of time here. So I just want to review um, everything that I talked about that I, there's my little cheat sheet I've been looking at <laughs> the whole class. Um, so here are my still life composition tips. So for thumbnails, so we created a backdrop. We want to have a strong sense of foreground, middle ground, and background. We're telling a story. We have a strong light source. Um, we want to keep in mind the rule of thirds. You want to create a flow. I think that kind of happens more um, with, you know, how you're, you're focusing your attention in these thumbnails. Hopefully that flow is happening negative space, and then, yeah, oh, experimenting with angles. So any dramatic angle, you know, if you were to change your, your viewpoint and maybe look at it, like I'm just looking from this overhead view at my still life. But if you, you know, wanted to take your camera out and maybe take some photos of your still life from some various angles, you could quickly make some reference photos for yourself for thumbnails from all of these various angles that you might approach it from. Um, yeah, so you want to aim for about five to six thumbnails as you're getting started on, on any subject. It's going to help you troubleshoot any issues that you're encountering along the way. It's going to help you find the most interesting composition. It's going to uh, help you have fun because you're going to edit out anything that you don't want and you're going to make informed decisions about what you liked the best uh, about that still life composition. Well, I want to see what you guys did. I want to see your thumbnail sketches from tonight and I see what still life items you guys have been working with. So does anybody want to share and Kelly can spotlight your um, your sketches. Um, yeah, I can hold up the, the tips again, uh, but sideways so that you could get a snapshot, sure. <laughs> I don't know if I can get it all in there. I wrote it on a long skinny flip of paper. Um, so create a backdrop, foreground, middle ground, and background, tell a story, strong light source. These were kind of, this was mostly my cheat sheet, so it's not in any particular order, but um, yeah, things to keep in mind as you're setting up the still life and also as you're you're drawing those thumbnails. Um, thank you guys so much for all the lovely comments. So um, yeah, let's see some of what you guys did. Let's have some folks hold up their sketches and Kelly can spotlight your drawings. Oh, I'm seeing lots of gorgeous thumbnails. Um, Kelly, did you want to spotlight a few folks? 
Hey, Adrian. Sorry, I'm. I cannot spotlight right now because we would have to have oh. <laughs> sign off on that. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Um, okay. Well, I'm seeing a few of them. Let me see. Keep holding them up, and I just want to like see a few more. Even though on the recording, none of them are going to be showing up. I see Maureen. has got a, some really good contrast happening there. Um, oh, I like Geetha held up the her subject as well as one of her favorite thumbnails there. Awesome. So yeah, hopefully you guys got a lot out of this and you'll keep going with your, your favorite thumbnail and create a more detailed sketch or developed still life. Um, from this and hopefully you'll join me for one of the next classes. Um, I've got another one coming up on Wednesday and then uh, also Thursday afternoon, even before my my other class that I mentioned. And then next Sunday there's another one. So hopefully we'll we'll meet again. Um, but thank you so much and tag me on Instagram if you post anything or follow me on Instagram so I can see your work if we didn't get to see it um, in the class. All right, well, I enjoyed it. Thank you both. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Adrian. All right, thank you, Kelly. Have a good one. Thanks, everyone. Bye. See you.